Good morning, church. How you doing today? Come on. All right, I'm going to do some crowd equipping, so you got to match my level of enthusiasm. So if I was like, you know, if I was like, you can't. I'm good. I'm good. So let's try. Church, how you doing? Woo, so I'm like, now, if I come out and be like, hey, how's it going, y'all? Okay, cool. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Just some, I'm here to equip. I'm here to make you better. I'm so glad you're here today. How about a little fist bump, somebody close to you? If you're married, feel free to go biblical, biblical and greet each other with a holy kiss if you'd like. I'm excited for us today. It's a big day for us. It is small group launch day today. Uh, and I invite all of you. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you. We're going to end early today. I'm going to give you an opportunity to interact together and to go into the atrium and interact with some small group leaders and just see the different groups. You can go onto our website and, and read about all the groups. We have a lot of groups that just continue year-round, meet ongoing. But a couple times a year, we like to do just special launch times uh, to give you a chance to do something new and different and to grow in a different way. So uh, it is a launch day for us. And I just want to uh, put up a quick little slide to show you four next step options that I invite you to take. One or more of these. And I've, you've heard me say recently, my passion right now is to equip you. I don't want to give you a step and not equip you on how to do it. So these four steps, I would love for everyone here to connect with a smaller group and start taking the mask off. Uh, and uh, so last week I did a little small group, first time participant equipping in the message. We do small group leader equipping, and today is launch. So I invite you to find a group for this next little season. Also, if you've never been baptized, if you've not been baptized since saying yes to Jesus, uh, I want to do something a little different. I'm going to do a baptism Sunday, September the 15th, I believe. Yes, September the 15th. So I'm going to do a whole message on the reason we're baptized and the beauty and the significance of it. And then we're going to baptize that day. So you can go ahead and go onto our website, to the events page, and register to be baptized. I'll also open it up that day to respond in baptism. So it's just going to be a big baptism celebration day. The third thing is if you've not become a member of our church... I'm actually going through a lot of that material in this Discover Together series. So I invite you to just kind of commit to this series. And if you really feel aligned with what we're about as a church, we're going to do a membership lunch, a membership social the last Sunday in September. And soon a link on our website will be up where you can register for that. That is simply so that we know how many people are coming to prepare a meal for you. So, uh, and then the final thing which you'll hear more about in the coming weeks is just if you look around, uh, you'll, you'll hear today one of the passages we read that God's put gifts in you not for your benefit, for the body's benefit. And so we invite everyone to just use their gifts and to be a part of some aspect of ministry here. When you walked in, you encountered a lot of different ministries. We have outdoor greeters. We have inside greeters. I'm looking at camera people, sound people, our media room, prayer room people praying for folks right now. Our offering team, a uh, team that helps set up the platform, our worship team, our kids ministry. There's uh, a whole bunch of teams all working together. And I just invite you to be a part of this family. Let's just do group life together and care for one another. And let's just serve together. So in the coming weeks, I'll share more. We're really upping our equipping for our team life participants and really uh, hopeful and excited about the days ahead there. You'll, I'll get more information for you. But today, here's what we're going to do. It's going to be uh, the flow is going to be fire hydrant fast. I'm going to do a rapid teaching, and then we're going to slow it down and meditate 
slowly together through a passage of Scripture. In fact, a chapter out of the book of Romans. It's Romans chapter 12. And so you are welcome to go ahead and open your Bible to Romans 12. Uh, log into your device to Romans 12. We're going to walk through that slowly together to end today. And we're going to end early uh, to give you time to interact and find a group. So uh, I want to do a teaching, rapid fire teaching on the big story that we are a part of, the big story of the Bible. Um, so let's just pause and pray. So Father, I thank you for the men and women in this room. I see beautiful gifts, beautiful, incredible potential. God, thank you as our potter and shepherd for continuing your work in our lives, for molding and shaping us into your image. I pray today we take one more step toward uh, becoming like Christ and looking like him and, and retraining our mind to think like you, God. So, uh, Father, I pray you would unify our hearts and focus and bring revelation to us in your incredible love story for the world. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Awesome. Let's dig in, y'all. So uh, uh, one of the common questions in ministry is sort of what age are we in? What's happening in the world? How is God moving? Are we in the last days? When is Jesus coming back? Uh, that's a whole story called eschatology. And uh, here's, I'm going to give you kind of my take on some of that. Uh, I say be wary of anyone who claims to know exactly when Jesus is coming back. He said no one knows the hour or the day. Uh, and so uh, anyone who says this is when, I don't know, but the Bible does give us uh, various signs. Uh, and tells us to always be ready. And so you've heard me say, hey, we don't know when the last days are, but we are all in our last days. Like life is a vapor. We're not here long. We don't have much time left. So you sh we should all just live ready because we're moving toward our final, our final breath. Uh, it, it's just it's coming. It, it's, life is undefeated if we're going to step through that door. So um, I want you to be ready, but I want to show you kind of how I, uh, one of the ways that I look for signs uh, that's happening in the earth. Um, and, and I'll just go ahead and tell you, in this equipping process for membership, uh, I've rewritten some things or added some things because I want, I feel like in the days we live in, in all the changing culture, uh, I want, we get asked a lot. For instance, we get asked a lot about uh, sexual identity issues and things like that. And so I want to equip you. I'm going to do a message in the next two or three weeks just on reading the Bible through the lens of marriage and how that plays out and speaks to a lot of today's sexuality issues and identity and things like that. And I really want it to be very encouraging and helpful and hopeful, not divisive and mean. And uh, so I'll, I'll give you a heads up on that. Not so sure that'll be kid appropriate. Maybe so. Well, I'll give you a heads up. Uh, but uh, it's such a big deal and so connected to our relationship with God and identity in Christ. I really want to be encouraging to everybody there. So that's one lens. I love reading the Bible through the lens of marriage. And, and, and it'll, if you've not heard me do that, just erase whatever you think it's going to be because it's, it's not that. It's, it's, it's a very uh, different way of reading the whole story of the Bible. Uh, you can, there are different lenses. You can tell the story of God through meals. It starts with a, a meal, this moment where Adam and Eve eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then in the Old Testament, a big season was the, all the feasts and the Passover meals. And, and then uh, Jesus shows up and celebrates, turns Passover into the Lord's Supper. And then they would have love feasts as the early church, these sharing of meals together. We continued to practice that on, on some way with the Lord's Supper. And then the Bible ends with a great meal that we're going to have. It's called the Wedding Supper of the Lamb. So you can tell the whole story of God just using meals. You can do the same th thing through uh, battles. You can do the same thing through trees. It starts with these two trees. Jesus hangs on a tree. It ends with this reestablishment of the garden. Now, it's fascinating to 
and helpful to simplify this epic story of God. But if I were to say this is how I interpret the signs of the times and where we stand and what we're waiting for, for me personally, I look at the Old Testament feast because I think they speak to what has happened and is about to happen. Uh, Timeline, I don't know. Uh, We could be very close to the end of this age, but I don't know. Um, And I don't know if we can know, but we can be ready, and we should be ready and anticipating it. But let me just kind of paint a picture of the big story through the feasts. And so uh, I'll put a slide up. These are Uh, the spring feast. So just so you know, when you read the Bible, the events take place following the lunar calendar. We follow the solar calendar. So the timeline doesn't really line up with our uh, our calendar today. Uh, But uh, God had them every year to celebrate these different, throw these different parties uh, or feasts or festivals. Now, the peop- God's people really probably had no idea the significance. God says, I want you to do this so you don't forget what I have done. But now we have the vantage point of looking back and saying, wow, that was not only a reminder of what God did, but also a foreshadowing of what he would do through Jesus. Let me explain some of that. So these are the four spring feasts. Then there were three fall feasts. But the four spring feasts, I believe, have already been fulfilled, and they were fulfilled in the life of Jesus, during the days of Jesus. So the Passover feast, I'll just explain that one. Uh, If you go back all the way to Exodus, you've got God's people enslaved to the Egyptians for hundreds of years, about 400 years. During that time, They were taught to worship all of these false gods. There was a God of the sun and the God of the moon and a God of the sea. And everything had its own God. And they were oppressed and mistreated and enslaved. It was a horrible season for God's people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews. So God finally says, enough is enough. And he raises up a shepherd man by the name of Moses. And he says, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Pharaoh was little G God on earth. He was worshiped as a God man on earth with incredible power and authority. So you can imagine a shepherd showing up to Pharaoh saying, hey, I need you to let God's people go. Pharaoh's like, "Uh, no. So God brings these incredible plagues, and you see this wrestling. Little side note, just to equip you when it comes to creation. I had this conversation with my daughter recently because, you know, you get into school and people are talking evolution and uh, the, all the science, and, and I'll just kind of, Genesis 1, you, when you read it, I, I just think, God created science. I'm not scared of science at all. God understands it fully. I think it's beautiful. When you read Genesis 1 creation, you need to understand the purpose of it was written. Genesis 1 was not written as a history or science lesson. So if you're trying to pull all of history and science out of it, you need to, that's not the intention. Let me give you kind of the context for Genesis 1. Moses helps to be a part of this incredible rescue of God's people. But all they've, this generation of God's people, all they've been exposed to are all these false gods. There's a God of the sun, the God of the moon, a God of the sea, a God of the land. And God sends these incredible plagues. And if you read the plagues, they specifically and powerfully attack each of those false gods. So through the plagues, God is showing the Egyptians and his people, there is a God greater than these gods. So when they are set free, they're like, who is this God that just rescued us? And Moses sits down and he writes down, let me teach you, there is a God who created that sun. There is a God who created that moon. In the beginning, the real God created the heavens and the earth. And so he is just letting them know There is a God that is greater than all these gods you've been talked about. 
There is a God who is in charge of it all. And you can know him, follow him, and he has a purpose for your life. So it's not really for us to dissect and pinpoint timelines in history. Although, that's a fun conversation. Just understand the context and the purpose of this writing. So God directly attacks and defeats all of these false gods in this rescuing of his people. And then they're on the run and God says, I don't ever want you to forget what I've just done for you. If you remember the last plague, it was the most horrendous, violent of them all. And it was known, became known as Passover because... It was when the ain't God sent an angel of death to pass over the land, but he wanted to spare his people. So he says, I want you all to go out and find a lamb without blemish and sacrifice this lamb, spill his blood, and cover your doorposts with its blood. And when the angel of death passes over, every home covered in the blood will be rescued and spared. All the other homes experienced horrendous death. So God said to his people, every year I want you to celebrate Passover and I want you to sacrifice a lamb and I want you to retell the story so that you never forget that I am here for you, I will rescue you, I love you, and I'm going to protect you. And now we have the vantage point of, oh, wow, that was way more than just about what he did, that's what he was going to do in Jesus. Jesus would become known as the Lamb of God without blemish, raised up on a tree whose blood was spilled, and now everyone who's covered in the blood, you will be rescued, and you will have eternal life, and you will be forgiven and protected by God. So this timeline of the feasts lines up perfectly to the day of these feasts that they would celebrate every year. So on Passover, Jesus was raised up on the cross, and the Lamb of God's blood was spilled, and he purchased forgiveness for all of us. And now all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's the joy of my life to give you the good news that your salvation has already been purchased. Your forgiveness has already been sealed. It is finished. It is done. Just receive it. Say, yes, I need it. And all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then after Passover, the next feast was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so much of that lines up beautifully with Jesus going into the ground and a lot of the meaning and similarities there. After that, it lines up with the Feast of First Fruits. That's when he rose from the dead, presented himself to the Father. The Feast of First Fruits, God says, whenever you plant a crop, the first fruits that come up, I want you to present them to me out of faith. And if, and if it is an acceptable offering, then I will bless your whole crop. So Jesus is described as the first. The Bible says he is our first fruits offering. He presented himself as an acceptable sacrifice. So now all who are part of his family, we all get the blessing. Then finally, Jesus ascends to heaven, and he calls his people to go pray and wait. And lining up perfectly on the day of Pentecost, the celebration of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes and ignites the church with power and passion, and it begins to spread like wildfire. So I believe that the first four feasts have been fulfilled in the life of Jesus. That takes us to the final three fall feasts. And if you look at those, we have three feasts that I believe that's what we're waiting for. The Feast of Trumpets, I believe the next fulfillment is somehow, some way, God is going to say, it is time No more pain, no more suffering, no more famine and disease and wickedness. Somehow, he's going to get the world's attention to announce his return. 
It may be an actual angelic trumpet or shofar. I don't know. It, it very well could be. But God is going to announce his return. And at that point, the whole world will focus on Jesus. Following that feast, you have the Feast of Atonement, which lines up with what the Bible reads as a day of judgment, or we call it Judgment Day. Just to prepare you for that time, there are actually two judgment days. The first judgment is, did you receive the forgiveness of Jesus? God will say, did you receive my son? How did you respond to my son giving his life for you on the cross? Did you receive him or deny him? And that will separate the sheep from the goats. You'll either be on the right hand of God or the left hand of God, received into his presence or cast away. I pray that everyone who hears this would say, Jesus alone could purchase my forgiveness and I'm all in on him. The first judgment is simply, did you receive my son? The second judgment is not one. The first one will lead to weeping and gnashing of teeth. It'll be a great and terrible day. It'll be great and it'll be terrible. But the second judgment will be one that will be more of a celebration. And that is the judgment similar to watching the Olympics and the judges show up to award the prizes to the winners. That's the second judgment where Jesus says, I'm coming back and I'm bringing gifts with me. And he says, I'm going to reward everyone for everything they've done on earth. And so the Bible teaches, I believe it's Corinthians, that anything we do that is not for the kingdom of God, the glory of God, it will be burned up. But everything that we do in our time on earth, all the way down to offering people a cup of water in the name of Jesus, he says, that will not go unrewarded. It's just going to be Jesus showing up with eternal gifts and just judging your works on earth, saying, I want to bless you and reward you. There'll be special rewards for those who were martyrs, special rewards for your faithfulness. And everything we do, it should inspire us every day just to be a blessing. And all that we do, do it for the glory of God. And Jesus is just going to reward, reward, reward. So that's the season of atonement or judgment. And then the last one is the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is when we are received into our eternal home, eternal glory, to rule and to reign. Eternity in heaven is not going to be sitting in pews, singing hymns. Nothing wrong with that, but it's going to be, the Bible says, greater than anything we could ever imagine. So I love to sit around and just come up with what would make heaven awesome. And I'm like, I want to fly. I want superpowers. I want pew, pew, pew. You know, like I, just, I just come up with what would make heaven awesome because I know the God's told me it's going to be better than anything you can imagine. So I'm like, I can't wait. It's going to be incredible. We're going to rule over galaxies. We're going to be beside these crazy angelic rulers and beasts. Like it's going to be amazing. And God's going to give you an eternal mission and your abilities will be in. I don't know what it's going to be like, but it's going to be awesome. And so that will be the time of now we are once again a family. So when will the trumpet sound? I don't know. I don't know when or how, but let's be ready for it. And let's use our time. That brings us to where we are now, the summer harvest. They would do the spring feast. The fall feast, and in between, they would gather the harvest. And I believe that is the age we find ourselves in right now where Jesus says, look around. The harvest is plentiful. We need more workers. Because right now, the only thing holding God back from saying, Jesus, it's time, is his absolute patience for his lost sons and daughters to come home. This is the time where he says, go get my sons and daughters. Bring them home. And I just want you to imagine, 
you as a parent, if one of your sons or daughters is lost or missing, you'd be saying, God, wait, not yet, not yet. Wait for my boy. Wait for my daughter. That's the age we live in. And I pray, no matter what you do in life, may you always carry the harvest within you. Always think about what am I doing to reach God's sons and daughters? Because this is the harvest time. And when the harvest is gathered, God says, now it's time. Jesus, go get them. Let's celebrate. Let's go home. So, God's plan is to rescue us, to save us. His strategy for doing that, don't really fully understand it, but from the beginning, his plan has been for us to do this together in family, as a family. If we look at the story of Scripture, we see God placing us in family since day one. Genesis started with the first marriage. The Bible ends with a final marriage. In Exodus the story when God rescued Pharaoh, let my people go. When he rescued his people, he made them four promises. These sacred, holy, they're called the four I wills. In fact, team, if you'll put those up for a minute. These are the four promises. He says, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. In other words, I'm going to save you. I'm going to rescue you. I will free you from being slaves to them. That is, God gets us out of Egypt, then he's got to get the Egypt out of us. We got to stop thinking like slaves, talking like slaves, acting like slaves. He redeems us. He restores us. He heals us. I'll redeem you with outstretched arms and mighty acts of judgment. And then, ultimately, he says, I want us to be a family again. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. We're going to be family. Back to the bullet points, if you don't mind, team. You've got Exodus, I wills. In the Old Testament, he organized them into families and tribes. Jesus shows up. He puts us in a family called the body of Christ, also called the church or the bride of Christ, still putting us in a marriage, putting us in families, and then we see the final marriage. So this is what, how I want to end today. There is a word that helps us understand how to do this. I need you to think that there is a way to do family in the family of God that's different from any other relationship you have. And as your pastor, I want to equip you to do that. Because if you're dating someone, that's different than any other relation. You're going to treat them differently than other people. If you're married, You treat your spouse differently, hopefully differently, than anybody else. If you have children, you treat them in a very special way. You treat your coworkers a unique way, your friends a unique way. Every relationship comes with unique differences. Being in the body of Christ has a unique and special way to do this. If your only connection with the body of Christ or church is showing up on Sunday... I will say thank you for that. That's a big step. I just invite you to go deeper. There is a more beautiful way to experience God through his family. But our problem is we carry our earthly family norms and traditions into the body of Christ's family. And that's where we start messing up. Every family, you got your own family traditions. I just yesterday uh, had the honor of being with uh, Miss Mary, uh, was a part of our church for many years. Many of you knew her. She was always dressed beautifully in hat. She has three daughters here, uh, uh, Deborah and Mary and Lawanda. And we got to celebrate her life yesterday, did a little uh, memorial down at the chapel. But one of the things that's so special to me is when I walk with families through losing a loved one, I get to sit down with them and just I get a picture into their life and in their story. And let me just tell you, 
I was so wrong about Miss Mary. I see this beautiful uh, lady, so small and tiny and put together. And then they're like, let me tell you about Miss Mary. She had one rule. When the street lights go on, you better be in the house. And if you ain't in the house, she's going to throw a frying pan across the room to get you straight. I'm like, what? Miss Mary? She said she had two passions in life, westerns and wrestling. Not wrestling, wrestling. <laughs> You're blowing my mind right now. Like, she's like, if wrestling's on, you don't interrupt her. She loved her wrestling. I'm like, this is awesome. I love Miss Mary. Like, I don't know what your family's like. But I just like, I just want to visit every family. I just love people. I love getting into homes and seeing how y'all tick and all your craziness and things you do. Some of y'all are yelling families. Some of y'all are quiet families. Some of y'all take your shoes off. Some of you are dirty as you know what. Some of y'all like, I don't know. Everybody's different. But that's beautiful. But we learn to communicate at home and we learn to treat each other a certain way. But God says, in my family, there's a way to do things. There's a way to treat each other. There's a way to handle conflict. That's what it means to be a member of the body of Christ, the family of God, the bride of Christ. So we have to retrain ourselves. How do we do this together? And so I want to introduce you to the word that helps us know how to do this. It is a Greek word called alelon. And any time, I always say, God wants to move us from all alone to alelon. Like, God does not want you to be alone in life. Uh, I believe in Psalms, it says, God, God puts the lonely in families. God wants special care of widows and orphans. God doesn't want any of us to be alone. So he brings us into this thing called the family of God. And the New Testament uses this word right here, alelon, over and over and over to teach us how to do this thing called family in the family of God. And so whenever you see the, the, the two words, one another, the word is actually alelon. And it means one another or mutually or, y'all, I got words in English that I can't say, and that's one of them. I don't know what it is about that last word. I just can't say it. So I'm going to get you to say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Reciprocally, I can't do it. I don't know what it is about that word. Reciprocally. Reciprocally. Broccoli. I don't know. You get it. reciprocally, reciprocally, reciprocally. I can't do it. I can't do it. It just simply means I'm going to treat you this way and you treat me this way. We're going to do this for one another. So the next couple of weeks, we're going to take a little journey through the one another's, which by the way, our membership commitment as a church is simply the one another's. This is how we commit to treating each other. Through the one another. And almost every letter of the New Testament uses this phrase, alelon, or one another. And it's used like over a hundred times. It's everywhere. So I want to end today by taking a very slow and intentional reading of a chapter of Scripture, Romans 12, that has so much alelon packed into it. But I want to do it a little differently. I want to do it kind of devotionally. And here's what I ask. We're not just going to speed through it. I'm going to ask that you would pause with me and pray for the Holy Spirit to illuminate for you just one verse that we read. And what I'm praying is that God would illuminate in your heart when you read a passage, one of these passages, that it would jump out where God's saying, that's where I have you right now. And it may lead you to go to someone else in your life or in this family and maybe extend a blessing, forgiveness, 
So, for instance, in the body of Christ, God teaches us this is how we should handle conflict. I'll go deeper into this one of these Sundays. But we believe that God teaches if you have, a, if there's something between you and someone else, you, someone said something hurtful, did something hurtful. Now, there are instances where, not getting into the super tragic stuff, but, you know, somebody hurt your feelings. They did something that, um, I, I think the Bible teaches us in this family, we should go quickly and go privately. The tendency in the world, and maybe the family you grew up in, is you chew on it for a while. And you replay it in your mind. And it begins to grow. And you get madder and more hurt and more bitter and more. It eats away at you. And I think this is why the, the Bible teaches, um, I think it's even in the same context. Don't let the sun go down on your anger or the devil will get a foothold in you. Like, don't go home and just stew on it and replay it. When you do something, go. When someone's, something's done, go. But it also says in Matthew 18, go privately because we have a tendency to go to other people and say, let me tell you what so and so said. Or worse, we get on social media and that doesn't bring healing or restoration or reconciliation. So that's just, again, this is how to do things differently in the family of God, which will hopefully spill out into all of our relationships. But it goes against our instinct. It goes against what comes naturally or what we want to do. I get it. Same way. So I pray that as we read this, God will just illuminate one of these verses that maybe will lead you to take an intentional step as we end the service and just test God in it. Put it to practice and see what happens. So I want to read this with you. We're going to go slowly. But first, let's pray. And... As you read your Bible, there's a couple things you can do. One, you can pray through what you're reading. So if you read, love is patient, you can just stop right there and say, God, will you fill me with the kind of love that makes me patient? Anytime you're praying scripture, you know you're praying the heart of God. Like if you get up to bat, and pray for a home run. I don't know if that's the will of God or not. Maybe. But this I do know. You pray scripture. It is the will of God. It's the heart of God. So you can pray through the scripture you're reading. The other is to just move through it slowly. And ask the spirit of God to illuminate where he has you. Where his focus is in your life. And then take action. A quick action. And just get in the habit of being not just hearers, but also doers of the word. And so just read slowly. Say, Spirit, speak to me. Speak to me. Oh, that's it. I need to act on this, and I want to do it quickly. Train yourself to be obedient to the Spirit of God, His word. So I want to pray. Father, I don't know what you want to say to each of us, but I pray in these last couple of minutes that you would illuminate something from this chapter in each of us and call us to an action that will just bring healing and life and hope. Get glory through these interactions in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, let's do this together. Romans 12. Verse 1, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and, and proper worship. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, teach. If it is to encourage, give encouragement. If it is giving, give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. For years, that was my life verse from the Amplified Bible. It says, never be lacking in zeal or in earnest endeavor. Be a glow, burning with the Spirit, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. Told first service, I think that's mine. Faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And finally, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Some people have interpreted that as... If you'll do good things to people who've hurt you, it'll just infuriate. Like, if that's the way you really... That heap burning coals on their head is traced back to a Proverbs, which is traced back to a tradition, an old tradition, where if someone was very remorseful or repentant, they would walk around with hot coals to just express their sorrow. So what God is saying here is if someone has hurt you, if you have an enemy, sincerely Bless them and pray that your kindness will just bring them to remorse. I saw a video clip this week of a woman delivering food through an app. She was a food delivery person. And when she got there, the woman opened the door and said, Oh, I'm sorry, I, I had cash, so I, 
that's how I wanted to tip you. And so she went to give the woman this wad of cash, and the woman's face just stopped. She said, no, keep it. She said, I noticed on the app that you didn't tip me, and I put a really nasty note in your bag. Keep it. Like that's a moment of burning. Co- that's what bless someone in hopes that they will real wake up and say, "Oh, I don't want to be enemies with you. Let's bless each other again." Do not overcome. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So let me pray for you. We got five minutes. We're going to end early. We're going to end with a short little commitment slide together. But, Father, I pray now that you would illuminate a scripture and that we would be courageous and bold to actually test you in it and act on it. God, I pray movement in our life today, healing in relationships that have been broken a long time. So use us today and lead us by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all, let's stand together. And I've got one final commitment slide for us. And I want you to take a moment um, to read it. I don't want you to commit to something you haven't read. Make sure it resonates with the desire of your heart. And then I'm going to release you to just interact in here if there's someone you want to go to to either bless or extend forgiveness. And then in interact, just mingle outside, fellowship with all the small group leaders and just everyone find a group for this little season together. You ready? Say it with me, everybody. Today, we make a fresh commitment to family, our earthly family and our eternal family, the body of Christ. God, help us to multiply and show us how to do family in a way that brings glory to the name of Jesus. God bless you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Have fun together.